You're listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truths in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. Good evening to all of you today and uh, it's uh, hopefully tonight will be a a great night where we'll be able just to share uh, some of the wonderful truths of the Word of God and we'll follow on from where we were this morning and uh, we want to begin as we have been doing during this COVID time with uh, the singing of uh, this song. Hope you enjoy. Take your Bibles uh, and have them open at the 14th uh, chapter of the Gospel of Luke as we continue on tonight in our series that we have uh, been doing uh, for the last uh, uh, several weeks now. This is number 47 in the message, and we have pro- in the messages, and we probably have another 15 or 16 at least to go before we get to the end of Luke's Gospel, and then we. Uh, I think we may just bring a series, I've been praying about it, a series on meeting God in real life places, which will prove very interesting. And the Lord is leading me that way to speak on those issues in the not too distant future. But having turned you to the 14th chapter of Luke's Gospel, I wonder whether you've noticed that one of the best times of learning 
is mealtime. Have you ever noticed that? Mealtime. There's something about sharing food together that breaks down barriers and starts meaningful conversations. A professor, for example, uh, can teach passionately in a lecture hall to his students and inspire little more than a reaction of a few sleepy nods or a few sleepy yawns. But if you take those students and you put those students around the same professor in a dining hall where there's good food on the table, what you find is you often find they're asking questions and they're chewing on issues and gulping down concepts faster than he can really dish them up to them. In my own ministry, two occasions like that stand out in my memory particularly. One was in the Shaky Isles in New Zealand and the other was in the Apple Isle of Tasmania some uh, many years ago now. I was invited to preach uh, in New Zealand and uh, was invited to speak at a church in Tasmania. And people heard me preach and teach from a dispensational perspective in their churches. They had not heard this type of teaching before and the next day I was invited for a meal at one of the members' homes. They asked a lot of questions. A lot of questions about things like the rapture of the church, the great tribulation time that follows the rapture of the church and then the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ and a host of other questions on the scriptures. And as I spoke uh, over a meal, strangely, the doorbell began to ring, both in Tasmania and, uh, and New Zealand. The doorbells began to ring and people drifted in. And the room uh, quickly filled with people all eager not only to nibble uh, along uh, on the plentiful, plentiful amount of food that, that was on the table, but also eager to soak up the truth that they had not heard before, dispensational truth of the word of God. And two or three hours later, they were still there. I mean, it was fantastic. The New Zealand one was in the, in the home of, uh, in the home of uh, Morris... Uh, what's his name? Oliver. That's right. Thank you for... I had a senior's moment there for a minute. Don Oliver, his brother, was the Commonwealth weightlifting champion uh, back uh, many years ago, has gone home to be with the Lord. But the Oliver family knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And it was a joy to sit with some of those people and teach them some of the fantastic truths of the Word of God. And Jesus, the consummate teacher, certainly seems, as you look at his life, he certainly seems to have really understood that concept. Just, about, just think about how many significant lessons in Luke and the other Gospels took place over a banquet table or on a hillside picnic. For instance, can you remember where he performed his first miracle? His first miracle was performed at a wedding feast at Cana. And what about the time he took uh, the little boy's uh, loaves uh, and fishes and turned them into a lunch for 5,000 people on a hillside? Then there's the memori uh, memorable moment in Martha's kitchen when he turned down the heat under her boiling frustration and offered her a cool sip of his peace. And then later at the same house, he gave a lesson on the value of costly worship uh, when Mary anointed his feet with perfume during a meal. Then who could forget the most famous meal in the Gospels, the Last Supper, the night before Jesus went out and was crucified at a hill called Mount Calvary. And gathered around that table, the disciples surely savoured, I would suggest to you, every single solitary morsel that Jesus served. It was a feast of unforgettable lessons in servanthood and leadership and abiding in Christ and loving one another, the Holy Spirit and the future. And the nourishment of that meal, just think of it, would have had to last them through the lean and hungry and horrible days until after his resurrection when they would eat again. They would eat again with Jesus on the shore of Galilee and witness his encouragement to the old fisherman disciple, 
and apostle Simon Peter. And looking forward to the future, we see another meal. We see the glorious and wonderful marriage supper of the Lamb. And on that day, we will join him in celestial celebration that will last literally forever. What a meal that will be. And the stories go on and on and on. So when we find Jesus in Luke 14, sitting down for dinner, we are not surprised in the least that he takes uh, this setting as an opportunity to serve up some memorable lessons. Lessons that I'd like to suggest are spiritual table manners or spiritual etiquette. In the first verse, Luke uh, raises the curtain on a, a four-act play to follow. And Jesus, we find as we come to that first verse, has entered a house. And verse 1 says, to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, a prominent religious leader of the day. The man, as I would suggest, was probably a member of the, of the Sanhedrin, uh, Sanhedrin, the elite ruling body of the Jews that will later convict Jesus Christ of blasphemy. And I find it very interesting. I don't know whether you've ever noticed it all, but it's interesting that in spite of, all, in spite of the fact that the Pharisees opposed Jesus, they were his fiercest opponents, it seemed that he was often invited to the houses to eat, to have a meal at their table. The modus most often seemed to be that they might find something in his teaching, of course, to condemn him. And this occasion, let me point out, took place on the Sabbath day. They were constantly looking for him to break the Sabbath rules, the penalty for which was stoning by death. Foreshadowing the last week of Jesus' life. This leader and his pre-selected jury of Pharisees are already standing, you see, in judgment over Jesus. As I said, it's the Sabbath day. And the scripture says in the latter part of that first verse, he was being watched carefully. Literally, the Greek phrase means that they are watching on the side they are watching on the sly, watching insidiously with evil intent. Through narrow eyes, you see, what they do is they scrutinize Jesus. They scrutinize his every, every move, ready to jump to a guilty verdict the moment he trips over a Sabbath law. And what you need to remember is that God had created the Sabbath as a day of rest. That's the Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath. A time of refreshment in the green fields of his presence. But the legalists, the religious loudmouths of the day, had turned the Sabbath into a, a jungle of overgrown regulations. And you see, that's the nature of legalism. Legalism finds us running free in the open spaces of the marvelous, matchless grace of God and entangles us in so many rules that we can't move. And many places of worship in the Christian church today have rules and regulation that entangle their people and take away the joy of living in the fullness of grace. It makes fearful what God created for joy. And Jesus will have none of it. Not then, not now. The first scene opens with the introduction of a diseased man and a not so subtle, subtle challenge from the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And in verse 2 of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, we read, 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 we read these words. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Dropsy. Today we call it uh, oedema. And it causes the victim's body to swell grotesquely, often indicating a serious kidney, liver, blood or heart condition. 
And then adding to the, the suffering, the rabbis, the, the, the Pharisees attached a social stigma to the disease, you see. To them, the disease was, was the bitter fruit of a, of a grievous sin in the heart and the life of the person. So it's not hard to guess who probably staged the scene. It's not hard to guess for a single solitary second who set this meal up. Because the Pharisees, you see, knew that Jesus' compassionate heart would break for this suffering man and he would want to heal him. And he would want to heal him on the Sabbath. But it wasn't sympathy that moved the Pharisees to a position, to position him rather right in front of Jesus. They were using him to bait and, and a trap. And the Lord suspects the ambush and he flushes out his enemies with a question. And in the third verse of the passage in front of you, it said, Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Is it lawful to heal someone on the Sabbath day without it being considered a work? And earlier, uh, you will recall, perhaps as you followed along in our study in the 13th chapter of Luke's Gospel, the 14th verse, the synagogue ruler had stated the official position of the Pharisees on this healing business on the Sabbath. They simply stated that healing is illegal on the Sabbath. But which of these religious experts would be willing to step forward and face Jesus and defend their law. After throwing down his challenge, Jesus hears a shuffling of feet, I would surmise, a nervous cough maybe. But no one dares duel with him over this issue. And they don't du du duel with him over this issue because, you see, they know deep in their heart of hearts that God's law doesn't specifically forbid acts of compassion on the Jewish Sabbath. So, as the latter part of that fourth verse says, uh, or the first part of that first verse, uh, fourth verse says, they remained silent. But Jesus breaks the silence and demonstrates God's official position on the question. Follow along the latter part of verse 4 through to the end of verse 6. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately... Pull him out. And they had nothing to say. You see, from Jesus' point of view, this man had fallen into a deep well of suffering. And he was a son, you see, who needed saving, not a sinner who needed scolding. I mean, tell me, church, what kind of a religion would leave him to languish in the pit because it was a holy day? What type of religion would do that? The Pharisees couldn't answer Jesus for fear of revealing their own swollen hypocrisy. I mean, these guys, they were way out to lunch, let me tell you. In scene two of this domestic drama, the host relieves the awkward tension by calling everyone to the table. He and the Pharisees and the lawyers lead the parade of invited guests into a spacious dining room, the, the bottom center of, uh, of uh, this, well, let me say, put it in the, the perspective for you. They led, were led into this spacious dining room where a sumptuous banquet was being prepared and was being spread on a large U-shaped table. That's the way they used to eat in those days. 
And the bottom center of the U is the seat of highest honor. With the seats on its right and left the next highest. And so on, descending down in the order to the ends. And as soon as the socialites enter the room, they start jockeying for the best seats in the house. It's a grown up version of musical chairs. And uh, uh, Jesus notices it. He, so he sees the haughty glow in those who manage to grab the seats next to Pharisee, so-and-so, the most important person in the house, and as well as the sulky look of those who get bumped to the end next to the kitchen. And so he turns to the invited guests and he serves them some wisdom in the form of a parable. And we pick the account up in this seventh verse of the passage. Follow along in your copy of God's inerrant word where we read this. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table. He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do you take the place of honor? For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. And then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. And then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, you won't find many assertiveness training seminars giving that advice today. But let me tell you, that advice has been around a long time. It's been around, in fact, from the, day, uh, uh, from the days of Solomon. And Proverbs 26, uh, 25, verses 6 and 7 says this, and I'll quote it for you in the New Living Translation. It says, Don't demand an audience with the king or push for a place among the great. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head of the table than to be sent away in public disgrace. Today's wisdom says that getting ahead depends on how well you sell oneself, how well you present yourself. But Christ, you see, Christ's teaching turns this self promotion theory on its ear. And his advice is be content with the back seat. Be happy with who you are. Be happy with where you are. If God wants you in the front row, he'll move you there. And the honor will taste twice as sweet because you won't be expecting it. In the third scene, Jesus turns from honor seekers to address the one sitting in the seat of honor. And that's the host. And here is a man of influence. His guest lists include uh, only the cream of society. But he's about to find out that God is not impressed. Verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors, if you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, in, a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, we often give our hand in kindness to certain people because uh, we hope they'll give us a hand up someday, don't we? It's kind of like saying, you scratch 
my back, I'll scratch yours. And we say to ourselves, he can help my career. Or she can boost me to a higher social level. But the voice of Jesus tells us right here in the word of God to lift up those whom society, you see, has cast aside, cast aside the disabled, the hurting, the neglected. And if we give to those who have nothing to give, God will reach into his vault of glistening treasures and reward us when we step into his kingdom. And then Jesus exposes the uncommitted. This is hard truth for the people at the dinner party to swallow. And attempting to make Jesus' words more palatable, one of the guests opens the fourth scene with this exclamation in the, the latter part of the 15th verse where he says this, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now that's a dinner party everyone wanted to attend. In the following parable, Jesus explains who will be the fortunate ones eating bread at God's kingdom banquet. Verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet, banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Well, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. So I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master, to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Now God is the master who throws the feast. And Jesus is the servant, can I say, who delivers the message. And those on the guest list have known about the feast for a long time, for the invitations have already been sent. Yet when Christ announces the hour, they are preoccupied with other things. One man is absorbed in his business dealings. Another is anxious to try out his purchases. And a third is more interested in his new wife. So the master opens the banquet to anyone who will follow him. The trampled poor who were living in the street. The downcast beggars on skid row. The blind who stumble in the darkness who cannot see. Then the servant reports to the master, look, verse 22. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. You know, there can be no doubt that the ones who were bidden were the people of Israel, particularly the leaders and the rulers of Israel. And the poor and the crippled and the blind would represent the willing, as I understand it, both Jew and Gentile, as we know that in the kingdom all the nations of earth will be blessed. 
So the master's voice reverberates with, a, with an urgency of a, of a ringing bell. Go, go, cry out to everyone you see, no matter who they are, compel them to accept the invitation. And the truth of the matter is that Christ is still crying out to the world to receive his offer of salvation and to follow him as it were, if I can say this, to follow him to the kingdom banquet. And many people make excuses. But plenty come. Enough to fill God's house with everlasting joy. So let me wrap up our thoughts for today. As the curtain closes on the scene at the Pharisee's house, we're left with the somber realization that none of those present will eat at God's table unless they choke down their pride and receive Christ's invitation. Which raises the question, did any of them do that? We're not told, but we assume they went on unrepentant with their dinner party. Now, so that we don't leave the party unchanged, Let's take with us four truths from these four scenes. First, we become short-sighted or blinded by the forces of legalism. We become short-sighted or blinded by the forces of legalism. It blinds us to anyone who doesn't follow our list of acceptable behavior and short-sighted to the needs of the world. Secondly, we become selfish by exercising the forces of pride. We become selfish by exercising the forces of pride. We start playing the childish game of who's better than whom. And we end up losing. Thirdly, we become sensitive and blessed by the forces of compassion. We become sensitive and blessed by the forces of passion. It helps us overlook the color of people's skin or the size of a person's wallet. And we begin seeing others through the eyes of Jesus. And then fourthly, we are moved to select when God's spirit beckons us to receive salvation. We are moved to select when God's spirit beckons us to receive salvation. And the truth of the matter is, with Christ, there is no middle ground. He makes us choose between the things of the world and the blessings of God's kingdom. God's, listen, God's celestial party is already being prepared. But the question is, will we be ready? Will we be ready when the dinner bell rings. If you're not ready, you need to get ready. And you get ready by trusting in the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I'm going to pray. If you've not come to Christ, never into a personal relationship with Jesus, pray this prayer and give the amen at the end. Dear God, I want to thank you here tonight for loving me. 
I confess, Lord, that I have sinned against you. So please forgive my sin. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to pay for my sin and rose again from the dead. And he did that in my place. You laid upon him my sin. And so tonight I confess Jesus as my Lord and I receive your gift of eternal life. Amen. I hope you enjoy this closing song. Thank you for tuning in to Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org. Until next time, God bless.